me know whenever you're ready. Perfect. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our seventh session. Um, we are so happy to see you. Um, welcome, Dr. Simon. Uh, you may introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you very much. I think we are going on well. Um, today, we have a very important topic. Um, and uh, the discussion is led by Dr. Grace Kanye. Dr. Grace Kanye is a consultant uh, obstetrician gynecologist uh, from uh, the University of Nairobi. She did both her undergraduate and postgraduate in the University of Nairobi. She's currently the head of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Chuka County Referral Hospital. Dr. Chu, Dr. Kanye is a passionate leader and healthcare in, in healthcare and has pursued various courses from the University of Washington, Kenya School of Government. She's currently in the panel reviewing national reproductive health policy 2020-2030. As you can see, she's the, definitely the right person to do some of these trainings. She has served as a trainer in the Oncology Medical Training and Fellowship Program of East Africa. She has several publications under her name. And without much further ado, I would want to welcome Dr. Grace Kanye to take us through uh, today's session. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Dr. Kigondo, for that um, very kind, um, I would say, welcome note. Well, um, today we go through preterm labor and premature um, rupture of, of membranes. Um, as gynecologists, today is one of those very tough days for us to be discussing this topic. And uh, towards the end of this presentation, I will make some few um, comments on that. As very well presented, I am Dr. Grace Kanye. So the outline of my presentation today. Hi, Dr. Kanye. Yeah, hi. I, th I think I think your presentation disappeared. Oh, okay. um, maybe you try again. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, here it is. We okay now? Yes. All right, so this is the outline of my presentation. So as has been the gist of our presentations, we'll start with his presentation. But perhaps before we go uh, there, I wish to draw our attention into these four images under what I have titled Born Too Soon. This title has been borrowed from Ban Ki-moon on their report that they released in 2015 around the management of preterm uh, births and what we can do to prevent that. So where my casa is, is um, a preterm baby, perhaps about week 28 or, or, no, or around week 30. And this is a baby who will need all this, which is in the middle where my casa is, if this baby is to have um, a chance of survival. For us, supporting um, the, the breathing of the baby is for us um, supporting appropriate feeding of the baby, maintaining um, the temperature of, of this child, um, their bilirubin levels, they tend to always have jaundice. We have bilirubin lights over here trying to bring them down. More often than not, they tend to have cardiac issues. We have a cardiologist on board. Um, perhaps feeding may not be um, appropriate within the first few days of life. And so we'll be maintaining them with IV fluids. Literally, as you can see, the pocket of the father, if there was a mom, could be the pocket of the mom. We actually tend to spend quite a lot of money in ensuring that this baby can come to this other child on the extreme right. And so by way of introduction, we know that globally, around 15 million babies will be born as too soon babies. That means out of every 10, perhaps one is being born as a preterm. And close to 1 million of those babies per year many of them will actually end up dead. 
So in most countries, um, but this is uh, on a global scale, the preterm births is the rate is anywhere from five to eighteen percent. But behind every statistic, it is a story, as we are going to see uh, via our case presentation. But over and above, by way of introduction, we do know there are certain things we can do to prevent this preterm. Over and above, we do know that as we offer appropriate antenatal care, we are able to pick out which mother is likely to end up into preterm um, delivery and what can we do about it. And the third prong is that we know how to take care of the premature baby, which I will run through towards the end. And perhaps it's not true that we need high end resources to be able to take care of all of them. So let's dive into it. And we have um, our patient whom we have called ABC, 26 years old, who we admit into our unit as a part two plus zero gravida three at 32 weeks gestation with complaints of gush of fluid draining per vagina. So to make sure that we are all on board, what components of history should we take? Enoch, if you can pick someone for me. Uh, I, I just call anyone. <laughs> someone can volunteer, but if you take quite some work to make me. Any volunteers? You can unmute. Mm, hello. Hi, someone. Hi, hello. Well, uh, on part of the history, what to find out is whether they had any symptoms of uh, infections or they had fever, any false marine PV discharge. Yeah. Before right. the onset of the labor. Uh, before the, the onset of the gash of fluid training. Yeah. All right, that's perfectly in order. What else? Um, I think we'd also first want to know when they, when they first saw the gash of fluid, uh, so, so that we can know how long it has been going on, how, how much it was, whether it's still uh, ongoing. We'd also want to know the color of the fluid and if there is anything associated with the, with the lack of drainage. Okay. Right. Very good. All right, um, to take it further, we would still want to know, are there any fetal movements or not? Is there any bleeding that is accompanying um, this uh, drainage of, um, of, of life well? From there, we dive into the components of the antenatal history. She's after two weeks. Has she been attending any antenatal care? What has been done so far in terms of the antenatal profile? What's her HB, for example? What are her random blood sugars? Were there any issues prior to this day when she's getting admitted? Remember also to dive into the obstetric history. Uh, in her past two deliveries, we want to know the antenatal um, part of the first two um, babies intrapartum details, postpartum details. Then we dive into her past medical surgical history, screening for any chronic uh, diseases, which may actually predispose her to today presenting with drainage of Viqua. Top on the list is if she's diabetic um, or not. Then family social history, you want to find out um, for starters, does she smoke or not? Does she take alcohol or not? What um, sort of Engagement is she in? By engagement, I mean um, at your work, are you the type who's working for long hours and standing for a long period of time? Believe you me, that's actually one of the risk factors that we have for um, this preterm pre labor drainage of Lycra. Uh, then, after that, we examined patient ABC, and um, as is usual in all our facilities, our midwives will be the first contact with our patient, and below our physical findings. She was stable in good general condition, not pale not diagnosed, no edema, and no jaundice. Her vital signs were charted at BP 112 over 66 millimeters of mercury, pass rate of 82, respiratory rate of 20, temperature was not taken. Her abdomen, her fundus was marked at 30 weeks, breech presentation, longitudinal lie, fetal heart rate was hard and regular at 68 beats per minute. Our general exam was done where she was draining clear liqueur and the cervix was closed. 
So a little bit of comment from the participants. Can someone kindly comment on the above physical exam? Was it appropriate or not? Was something missed or not? What extra information would you have wanted us to get? Um, you can unmute us, your, yourselves again and we see. Good, good evening. Yes, Jerusha. Okay, on the part of history in physical examination uh -huh. okay the, sorry sorry mm -hmm. vital signs temperature was not taken mm -hmm. would have taken temperature so that you are able to assess in anything to do with it maybe an infection arising due to rupture of membranes then Correct. you have talked of Vaginal examination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't clear specific if you did vaginal um, speculum examination or digital, where mm -hmm. by digital examination would be contraindicated about gestation. Maybe mm -hmm. speculum would have done to assess the type of lica, the state of the cervix, the type of the amount of lica that is draining. And the color, the smell also is not indicated if maybe you wanted to rule out something like choreomyelitis. Then, a mm -hmm. state of the, as you do a vaginal examination, also report on the vaginal, the state of the vaginal was, was there any information? How was the cervix? Was it open or closed? Maybe something like that, someone else can add. Very good, Jerusha, well done. Someone else with something else to add on the abdominal findings? Are we happy about what has been documented so far? Yes, Kevin. Kevin. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So we can we can see the fetal heart rate is one sixty eight, which is fetal tachycardia. Uh, fetal tachycardia. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Um. Very good for for, for both of those um co colleagues who have contributed. Yeah. But. Notice that the temperature was not taken. And as Jerusha has said, this is something that we should be very keen about, especially when a mother presents with drainage of Lyqua. We always want to be able to, to chart their temperatures because as we continue to uh, monitor these mothers, the monitoring of the vital signs becomes a very key component in being able to track whether chorionitis is setting in or not. The abdominal findings, what perhaps I was looking out for was whether there was any uterine tenderness which was instead or not and whether the fetal parts were easily palpable or not. Very good for having noted that there was um, fetal tachycardia. On the vaginal exam, it's exactly as what Jerusha has said. Uh, whenever we have a mother who presents to us at 34 weeks or less, the skill or what we want to teach and to emphasize across all maternity units is that we always start by inspecting and we inspect through a speculum, but uh, the digital vaginal exam is contraindicated. So moving on to the last part so that we can dive into the discussion, how would you manage this patient? Participants, please um, give your contribution. How do you think you should manage this patient? Um, let's just look for five points. So kindly, again, unmute yourselves and um, give us like five major key points on how to manage this patient. Christine, Joy, do you want to unmute yourself and give us an answer? I think. Uh, hello, could you please come yes. up again? All right, we are under the part for institute management for patients ABC. 
and we are asking for at least yes. five things that we should do for this patient before we dig into the discussion to see if we have gotten everything right. Um, so we can start by confirming the diagnosis of PROM um, mm -hmm. by the fanning test, the mm -hmm. where you look at the liquid under microscope. Um, you can do the nitrazine test or the stroke litmus. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you can also do the ultrasound. You can do an amniotic fluid index. Um, mm -hmm. You can also give um, antibiotics. I believe it's erythromycin and ampicillin. Mm -hmm. Very good. Prophylaxis. Yeah. Um, and the workups to screen for any infection, like a full hemogram, um, cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Joy. Anybody else to add on at least two to three more? Things oh yeah, and and um, our biophysical profile. Yeah. Good. We did that with the ultrasound. Very good. Anyone else? Two or three more things. All right, I guess the two or more three, uh, the two or three more things I'm looking for, we're going to see them during the, the presentation. Um, oh, my screen is frozen. So by definition, the um, pre-labor rupture of membranes will be that spontaneous rupture of membranes at any time beyond week 28, but definitely before week 27. By categories, I want us to remember that we have the extremely preterm at less than 28 weeks, the very preterm between 28 and 32 weeks, and the moderate to late preterm between 32 and 37 weeks. In many centers, um, at least in our center, we are able to salvage a good proportion of the very preterm and moderate to late preterm. Very few success stories with the extremely preterm baby. So the incidence is anywhere from five to 10%. Remember I told you globally, it's standing from anywhere from about 5% um, to about 18%. And when we have pre-labor rupture of membranes at term, I want us to remember that 50% of those mothers will go spontaneously into labor after 12 hours. 86% of them will go into labor again spontaneously within 24 hours. 94% of them will, be, will have gone into labor anywhere from 48, 95 or 96 hours. And uh, just 6% of them who may not go into spontaneous um, labor. Majority of the cases of pre-labor rupture of membranes, we're not ever able to identify the exact cause. However, there are certain things that we know tends to increase the risk of pre-labor rupture of membranes. One is that we have increased friability of the membranes and associated decreased tensile strength of the membranes, where we have polyhydramnios, where we have cervical incompetence, and sometimes this can also be iatrogenic, if it's um, a lady who has had treatment of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, mostly with lip, where we have multiple pregnancies, close to 40% of them will be associated with pre-labor and preterm rupture of membranes. Infections, um, classically chorimnonitis, where we have urinary tract infection and sometimes lower genital tract infections. If the cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeters, if the mother has had a prior preterm labor, or if she has had a previous history of preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, or if she has had a previous history of pre-labor rupture of membranes, so those three entities. A low BMI, um, history of smoking and nutritional deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Some have also quoted working for prolonged periods of time, especially so with standing. I'm really emphasizing that because I know some of our nurses tend to work for a long period of time. And if they're in the category eight, I think it's only fair for managers to understand when we start putting them on bed rest at certain periods of their pregnancies. So some of these risk factors have put them down in a table and where that evidence has come from. So we look at the pathogenesis of rupture of membranes. And at term, we will have programmed cell death and activation of catabolic enzymes such as collagenases and mechanical forces, which will eventually lead to that rupture of membranes. So that same mechanism can be activated either because of the following. So one, if we have um, uterine 
irritability, either because of ascending vaginal infections. Or if we have um, genital tract infections, again, I'll put it down there, which will lead to increased production of glucocorticoids, then you end up with decreased amniotic collagen um, content. Relaxin, which is just one of those hormones, nice hormones that the body is preparing for somebody to be able to go into labor. If we have an upside of that due to one reason or another, we can end up with pre-labor rupture of membranes. Um, another way of putting that is how um, if you have chorionitis, it's your cytokines, your interleukins, the cytokine storm, which will eventually lead to degradation of that um, amniocorion and eventually rupture of your membranes. So how then do we diagnose that a lady has the pre-labor rupture of membranes? So many of the times it will be this lady who comes to the clinic or to the facility with a report of a sudden gush of fluid that has drained her vagina. And classically, many of the times with the lady who either tells you I was going about my normal duties, either at the store or at the market, and a pool of fluid, or either I've woken up from bed and I'm wondering for the first time in my life, am I licking urine or not? So it's usually very clear for many of them that they actually have broken their waters. And perhaps this also is due to the constant health education about the danger signs during pregnancy. So some of the signs for some who don't present to us a little bit early as we have taught them, they will present to us when they are actually running a fever and during that time, you'll find that their pulse will be elevated, that novat tachycardia. Their fetal heart rate, again, if um has set in, they're likely to be having a tachycardia. Her abdomen will notice that there'll be a reduced size of the uterus compared to the period of gestation. Again, um, to emphasize on this, we have to clack the patient a little bit better to be able to tell, is she having any other chronic underlying condition, like severe preeclampsia, which would lead to IUGR, and hence explain the reduced size of the uterus as compared to the period of gestation. Reduced lycoa volume and hence the easily palpable fetal parts. On the signs, some of the things that we want to make sure we do not find, and if we do find, we need to flag the patient um, as a patient who has chorionitis. I do not know how many centers have the males chat I keep on looking at how to implement that chart within our public hospitals, uh, where the printers many of the times print in black and white, yet we want the red, the red column, the yellow column, and the white column. Because if we find any of, I would say any of the three, should be a meow's chart on the red side. So maternal fever, anything more than 37.8. Maternal tachycardia, anything more than 120 beats per minute. Fetal tachycardia, anything more than 160 to 180, and sustained despite resuscitative measures. Per abdomen, if we're able to elicit uterine tenderness. When we put the speculum, we're able to appreciate false smelling amniotic fluid or false smelling PV discharge. When we do our WBC count, we find elevated white cell count with differential counts. That's a mom who already is to be flagged as one with columnitis, and we'll see what to do next. So the general exam, um, uh, again, just for repetition, we have said the per abdomen, the fundal height will be less than the gestational age with easily palpable fats, um, demonstrate lipoa, assess order vaginal discharge, exclude cord prolapse, because if there is cord prolapse and the story has changed, the diagnosis is pre-labor, premature rupture of membranes with cord prolapse, and we know at that point in time, if it's pulsating, it will be running to theatre. If in a center where you have an anal cervical swab, we'll take a swab for microscopy, culture, and sensitivity. We'll perform a nitrazine test and a fan test. And if they are positive, it will confirm that the fluid we are having within the vaginal canal is amniotic fluid. Even if you put a speculum and you don't find any pooling of fluid in the posterior phonics, kindly ask the mom to perform a balsava maneuver. And it's as easy as asking her to cough as hard as she can to try and appreciate if there's any leakage through the cervical canal. So we run through the investigations and why they're important. So the complete blood count is the white blood cell count and the differential counts. We want to know what's the HB of our patient, 
And we always want to know what's the platelet of our patients. Let's remember sometimes pregnancy can be associated with thrombocytopenia. If you're at a center where you are able to do the inflammatory markers, your C-reactive protein will be very important as it charts every two to three days if you can to see are we heading towards chorionitis or not. You can do your straightforward urinalysis, like at my center, we're not able to do urine microscopic chance sensitivity, but we're here to teach what ideally should be done. The high vaginal swab for microscopy, culture and sensitivity, nitrazine test, fan test, the Nile blue sulfate test, again, to try and confirm that that fluid you're seeing is amniotic fluid. The ultrasound to confirm the gestational age. Um, I do know in our setup, quite a good number of our women well, quite a good number of women in Africa, will not be able to tell you exactly on the day when the last period was. And if they come, many of the times it's by guesswork. So perhaps if she has an earlier obstetric ultrasound, it will help you with accurate dating of the pregnancy. Please remember the third trimester ultrasound is associated with plus or minus an error of 21 days. Second trimester scan is a plus or minus 14 days. The first trimester ultrasound is a five to seven plus or minus of days. So the earlier the scan, the better it is. If you're at a center again where you have your cardiotocograph, let's put up the CTG and look at the trace of that. And this ideally should be done way before the lady is put into the ward. So the nitrazine, um, we say it's a pH um, um, indicator. Remember if there's blood there, if there's an infection, if there was recent unprotected coitus, the, the three will give you a false positive. Then additional tests, um, well, I've never come across them. We only read about them. But then again, I'm hoping that even our interns moving forward, some of them can be at centers who are able to do this. The fetal fibronectin, if present in cervical secretions between week 22 to week 34. Excuse me, it's used for assessment for, of potential of preterm birth and the sensitivity is as high as 98%. Um, percent. In other centers, you're able to use the insulin-like growth factor binding protein, uh, more or less like what we use for the HIV kit tests. Oh, we'll be able to tell you whether we have preterm labor or not. Then we have the plus placental alpha microglobulin one. Again, these two have never come across them but you never know, you could be working in centers where it's routine to be able to do them for a mother who presents with pre -prom. So why are we here trying to address um, the management of pre-labor, preterm rupture of membranes? It's because we know of the maternal complications that you'll end up with preterm labor. And if you end up with preterm labor, then it means you're ending up with a child whose incidence or occurrence of cerebral palsy will be higher compared to the term baby, the babies end up with impaired learning. They have delayed achievement of milestones. They tend to suffer retinopathy of prematurity. A good number of them end up with hearing losses. A good number of them also have dental problems where delayed tooth eruption, tooth discoloration, and even improper alignment of the teeth has been noted. A good number of them end up with behavioral and psychological problems. A good proportion will end up with chronic health issues, top on the list, asthma and feeding problems, and sometimes just sudden infant death syndrome. But that's for the baby who survives the first 28 days of life. In the initial one week, they are dealing with hypothermia, they're dealing with being able to feed this very preterm baby correctly. It's the anemia, it's the jaundice, it's the birth asphyxia. Then we want to manage this mother a little bit better to prevent chorionitis in an attempt to try and prolong the labor to prevent the preterm um, delivery. If cord prolapse occurs, of course, that changes the dynamics of delivery as soon as possible. There's a concept of dry labor where you end up with um, in, I would say, um, incongruent labor. Many of the times you'll end up with a C-section and placenta abruptio, especially if so for the lady who had placenta, sorry, polyhydramnios sudden gush of fluid, and she ends up with placenta abruptio, which puts the baby at risk. The fetal complications are elucidated. I've outlined the nine of them, and the other one, two, three, four, extra complications that would occur if we end up with a preterm delivery. So the management then goals will be around these seven things. So one, what is the gestational age? And what is the status of the mother? 
and of the fetus. Is the mother at risk or not? Is she in labor now when she has presented with this preterm drainage of Lyqua? What is the fit of presentation? Because we know if she has ruptured membranes with the breach or transverse lie, the risk of cord prolapse is quite high. What is the fetal heart rate tracing pattern of the CTG? Or what is the um, obstetric ultrasound that we have done telling us about the status of the baby? Are there presence or absence of maternal infections? And are these lungs ready to be able to support this baby ex utero? Do we have a neonatal intensive care unit at our facility? And what can we do with what we have? We said 80 to 90% of them are likely to go into labor, but we are able to buy some little bit of time. So let's see what we can do in that buying of time to improve on the outcome of these babies. So I've divided my management into two, the general treatment and obstetrical management. Then we manage one, management of preprom with chorionitis, management of preprom without chorionitis at 137 weeks, and management of preterm prom without chorionitis. Pretty much the three things are things we see commonly in our obstetric units. So as a general rule is that we're going to admit the mother, put her on strict bed rest, pad monitoring, broad, broad spectrum antibiotics, and we're gonna see which one they're going to use, counseling of the mother, and when the family is available, it's actually a family conference for them to be able to understand. She has come in at 30 weeks, drainage of Lyqua. They want to do one, two, three things, but we do not have a NICU. Facility B has a NICU versus the cost of that NICU. And then maternal and fetal monitoring. For the maternal monitoring, it's their temperature, their pulse, their blood pressure, respiratory rate, which are to be done every six hours on a daily. Input output chart, the order of the Lyqua, uterine tenderness. Fetal monitoring is every four hours fetal heart rate monitoring. If there's a reason for us to do a CTG, we shall do it daily, okay? Where centers are, um, have it. In the absence of it, it's every week obstetric ultrasound. So the drugs of choice, remember we're trying to offer prophylaxis against the group B streptococci. So commonly we have been using the erythromycin as 500 milligrams is a title four times a day. Azithromycin is something that is being studied as something that can be added to the regimen of erythromycin, um, where we have confirmed group B streptococci, streptococci, sorry, sorry. So the drug of choice would be ampicillin, two gram IV every four hours. Then we have the administration of corticosteroids. And I think now the verdict is out, the action trial, even if it's a single dose of a corticosteroid, it will make a difference in the outcome of this child. So if we have betamethasone, it's 12 milligrams once a day, I am for two days. Many of our facilities have the dexamethasone. The dose is six milligrams, I am twice a day for two, for two days to make the four doses. Um, I really do not know where the concept of giving the dexamethasone 12 milligrams once a day came from. I would want to hear from colleagues and other participants because from what I know, it's just the six milligrams which actually works. There's room for repeating dexamethasone at 12 milligrams once if no delivery occurs within the next seven days. But they usually um, also advise that the repeating of the subsequent doses should be under expert advice. The next thing we shall give this mother if there she is in labor is nifedipine. So initially we start with a dose of 10 milligrams every 20 minutes till the contractions have been knocked off. Uh, some centers have the room for giving 20 milligrams um, as a one-off dose up until the contractions are knocked off and maintaining is at 20 milligrams twice a day for two days. The role of tocolytics is only for two days. Um, something else which is, was not on that slide, but on this slide under the third um, row, this row column, yes, third row, is the role of intravenous magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. And what I want to add here is, if you're going to give intravenous magnesium sulfate, then forego the, to the tocolysis with nifedipine, because magnesium sulfate also can has a role as a tocolytic agent. So the dose for this, um, it's for the same way we give it for um, prophylaxis in a mother who has severe preeclampsia. 
It's meant to be you load with four grams IV slowly over 10 to 15 minutes and then maintain at one gram per hour for 24 hours. Um, uh, pretty much that I think I've gone through this. That the cornerstone of managing PPRO. One, your antibiotics and the choice of drugs we have mentioned. Please avoid the coamoxiclav due to the necrotizing enterocolitis that the newborn will suffer. Dexamethasone, I cannot overemphasize on how this, even a single shot, makes a difference for these children. And the role of magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. And when we use it, please forego the nifedipine and, and the others. Now, something else to notice is this. If a mother has um, they're not going to buy the two days. So um, something else that I felt um, need to add over the next two to three slides is something that uh, my medical officers and medical officer interns always ask. Remember we said before we admit, either run your CTG, if you don't have your CTG, it's a CTG and obstetric ultrasound. If you don't have a CTG, you definitely have an obstetric ultrasound. If it's a health center, give the, um, the antibiotics, give the single shot of dexamethasone, I know you have it, then transfer the patient. So what I want us to pay attention is what happens to the fetal heart rate after we have administered the corticosteroids. So if you're running a CTG, you'll notice that there will be a decrease in the fetal heart rate on day one and an increase on day two and three. If it's on the variability, it will increase on day one and reduce on day two and three. And this will come back to normal on day four. A similar response will be observed if you have twins. This decrease in the fetal heart rate and the increase in variability will be more profound if you have an IUGR baby. On the biophysical parameters, fetal movements will reduce by up to 50% on day one and day two. Fetal breathing movements will reduce by up to 90% on day two and three. This, the movements and the breathing movements will be markedly reduced on day two, but they both will return to normal on day four. I'm saying that because we need to be aware what has happened to this baby after we have administered the corticosteroids to avoid a trogenic delivery of preterm fetuses. Um, I think this, perhaps Dr. Kegondi can tell us of classic examples. Some of our colleagues who are OBGYNs have been at risk of actually going and demanding for their babies to be delivered because I got my shots of corticosteroids, baby is not playing. Or I got my shot of corticosteroids, baby is not playing. We want to repeat an ultrasound and the biophysical profile score is even worse. So please bear this in mind. So now let's manage a patient who has pre-labor rupture of membranes with chorioamnionitis. Irrespective of gestational age, the mode is termination. So pretty much the only thing you can do for this baby is administration of magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. The single shot of the corticosteroid is controversial because of those who feel that it will flare up the infection. But I'd want to hear from other colleagues with chorionitis, do we give the single shot of dexamethasone as we terminate this pregnancy? So it's either induction of labor with oxytocin if there's no contraindication to vaginal delivery or going in for a C-section, but all the same delivery should be within 12 hours of diagnosis of the chorionitis. Management of pre-labor rupture of membranes without chorioamnionitis, and the baby is more than 37 weeks. We have nothing much to wait in terms of lung maturation. So active management is the best option. So induction of labor with oxytocin if the cervix is ripe. If there's an indication for C-section, we pretty much um, go for it. If the cervix is not ripe, we can improve its Bishop score and then allow for spontaneous vaginal delivery. Management of preterm um, rupture of membranes without chorionitis. So these are baby who is less than 37 weeks, but more than 34 weeks. We can actually buy time. If we don't have chorionitis, we can buy time. So give your antibiotics as we had indicated, your shot of corticosteroids, your magnesium sulfate, daily pad monitoring, and see how far you can be able to push this baby. So let's look at when we have sessional age of between 24 and 34 weeks. These are definitely international guidelines. So again, they say the same thing, administer corticosteroid, um, tocolytics, magnesium sulfate, then you can transfer to a center with neonatal support. Where we are at, it's counseling the patients about 
the need for NICU. Um, but I know sometimes most of our patients will tell you the issue is cost, but let it be a shared decision where you have actually told them which center will offer them the very best of outcomes. Then definitely if it's less than 24 weeks, we need to be able to cancel the mother on active termination of pregnancy, uh, but to actually be able to do this with a lot of tenderness, with a lot of love, with a lot of care. Um, by now we know every pregnancy is wanted. And perhaps the one who's presenting with um, this pre-labor rupture of memories less than 24 weeks has been wanting this baby all throughout. It's not unusual for this mother to tell you, to and sometimes just, you know, nature takes its course and eventually they expel. The reason why we are talking about active termination of pregnancy, remember the role of amniotic fluid with lung maturation, with limb formation, so that um, what we're trying to avoid is where we have pulmonary hypoplasia and um, iatrogenic, it's iatrogenic, no, it's congenital amputation due to the amniotic bands. So in summary, um, I used to be that student where when there's too much being said, I used to prefer having um, more or less like a flow chart. So scheme of management of pre-labor rupture of membranes. So maternal health assessment, um, is there overt polymonitis or not? Fetal gestational age, the weight, the maturity. Then you have done our septic workup uh, where we are able to do a high vaginal swab, urine cultures, our CBC, random blood sugar test, non stress test, CTG, blood physical profile through an obstetric ultrasound. We monitor on the daily every six hours her pulse, her temperature, her BP, her respiratory rate, fetal heart rates every four hours. We have initiated our broad spectrum antibiotics. Our dexamethasone um, should be on this arm and magnesium um, sulfate. Um, we are trying to see any perimenonitis, yes or no, placenta abruption, yes or no, fetal death or distress or labor. If it's absent, we're gonna pick that. If it's present, we say irrespective of gestational age, we expedite delivery, intrapartum antibiotics, baby to NICU, and we continue managing with IV antibiotics to this mom. So let's go to the arm which was absent. So we start with 37 weeks. More than 37 weeks, we can wait for spontaneous onset of labor. Within 24 hours, remember we say more than 50% will actually go into labor. If that fails, then we do our bishop score and we induce labor as appropriate. If it's less than 34 weeks, then there's room for expectant management, all right? If it's more than 34, but less than 37, again, there's room for expectant management once we are happy with the fetal lung maturity, we can deliver. The less than 34, we're trying to find if there's room for us to be able to transfer into a center which has a NICU. So um, I'm almost coming to the words, the tail end of this presentation. And the question becomes, can, then, can we then be able to prevent preterm labor? So there are three prongs that, have, that were identified in the Born Too Soon report in 2015. And the three prongs is one, the role of preconception care, being able to offer high quality ANC um, care, being able to screen the high risk women, being able to encourage smoking cessation. Then the management plan is what we have covered. The management three, I will keep on repeating it, be able to give tocolytic agents, corticosteroids and antibiotics. Then the, th the final prong is care of the premature baby. Um, my intent was to invite a pediatrician to this, but she also had a different presentation for their pediatric association. So now let's go to the first prong. Can we prevent preterm labor? So let's go through the different scenarios. So if it's a patient who presents for just her routine ANC clinic with no prior preterm birth, then we are going to offer universal um, cervical length screening through the second trimester ultrasound. Remember, we have three scans that we always want to do for all our pregnant clients. One, um, about 11 weeks. The next one between week 18 and week 24. And the last one from around week 36. So if the cervix is less than 25 millimeters for this mother, we'll just offer progesterone supplementation with no benefit of routine cervical saclage. I hope that is clear. No prior preterm birth, cervical length less than 25 millimeters, Progesterone supplementation has been found to actually give you more or less the same outcome with the cervical saclage. 
What if it's a patient with previous preterm birth with a short cervix? So for this, um, progesterone supplementation from week 16 or week 24 until week 34 or week 37. So the two gestational ages, ages are being given. Again, different guidelines will give you different things, but what you can say is progesterone supplementation from week 16 to week 37. Cervical saclage is indicated if the cervix is less than 25 millimeters. If it's a patient with previous preterm birth with a normal cervix, then we'll have to review all her past obstetric history to be able to actually make sure that the cervix is not the issue. And for her, it will be progesterone supplementation from week 16 to week 37. And the modes of administering the progesterone, it's either through the weekly IM injections or through the vaginal progesterone or through the oral progesterone. Um, here, let's not dwell into the companies. Different companies will tell you mine is superior to the other one. I guess the debate is just be able to offer adequate progesterone to support the pregnancy. What about in multiple gestation? For these ones, sadly, there's no role of saclage and there's no role of progesterone. Um, applying a cervical saclage to a multiple gestation could actually increase the risk of a preterm birth by twofold. Then beneficial interventions, vitamin C, vitamin E, some little bit of studies that have been done were found to have no role. Routine use of antibiotics like metronidazole and erythromycin with an intent to prevent preterm labor and to with an intent also to prevent preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes is not beneficial. Please do not confuse this with when the membranes have ruptured and we're giving it for prevention. The use of a cervical pessary, again, was studied and was not shown to be here nor there. So as of now, it's not quite being used. So what have I said as a pie chart for the ones who, again, are like me, who prefer to just look at diagrams to grasp what I've said in the previous four slides. So if she has a short cervix, which we have identified on um, the 18 to 24 week scan, if it's a multiple gestation, they say no intervention. If it's a single term gestation with no prior spontaneous preterm birth, vaginal progesterone, progesterone should be offered. And if the cervical length is less than 25 millimeters, a saclage can be given. Prior spontaneous preterm birth, we give them progesterone from week 16. Again, if you repeat that scan between week 18 and 24 and find it to be less than 25 millimeters, she qualifies for cervical saclage. Um, that's the same thing. So in summary, what have we said? That the role of preconception care cannot be underscored. If it's for the teenage pregnancies, um, the youth-friendly clinics being able to offer contraceptives, but to less than 18-year-olds, we both know it's against the law, but just to be able to encourage them to delay pregnancy, if, if we can manage to do that being able to encourage the full balanced diet because we know nutritional defici deficiencies can actually lead one to preconcept uh, to preterm pre labor rupture of membranes. If they are smoking, they cut out that. The high risk NC clinic, prompt diagnosis, antibiotic, corticosteroids, magnesium sulfate, being able to alert your pediatric team quite early when you have these patients, continuously monitoring them, and when you time for delivery, we are able to deliver them. So our patient eventually ABC, we're able to review her. The vital signs now are on 24-64 with a pulse of 89, respiratory rate of 19, temperature of 36.4. Her abdomen was non-tender, the uterus was non-tender, fundal height of 30 weeks, breech, longitudinal lie. Fetal heart rates were hard and regular on repeat 156. Circular exam, she was draining clear liqua, which was non false smelling with no cord prolapse. On Valsava maneuver, there was increased leakage of liqua through the cervix, which was closed. There were no overt lesions on the cervix, none was, and there were none on the vaginal walls. So, this was a summary of what we were able to do for her. Please note at our center, we do not have a CTG. At our center, we cannot be able to do microscopy culture and sensitivities, but that still does not stop us from being able to manage our patients. And two weeks later, she went 
were able to get this live female infant, 25, 60 grams, and both mom and baby were discharged home. This is really my last slide. In this era of COVID-19 um, and pregnancy, and currently with the Delta variant, and with the current thinking that perhaps delivering these moms quite early on in their gestation may make a difference for them. Are we then going to be seeing an upsurge of preterm deliveries? Um, then the next question becomes, is then COVID going to give us these babies that we had mentioned, who are going to have those nine complications that we had mentioned? And not to forget that sadly, many of these mothers are ending up as mortality cases. And I will ask us if we can observe a one minute of silence in honor of one of our dear colleague and a wife of a colleague who parted on today as we go on to the next session of Q&As. So one minute of to observe silence in honor of Dr. Becky. All right, thank you very much. So let's dive into the q and I see we have nine minutes. Dr. we have one question on the chat yeah. uh, from Kevin. Yeah. Uh, should mm -hmm. I read it? Um, from Kevin, um, I'm, I've opened my chat. So the use of lifedipine photocolysis in a mother with a previous car with pre-labor, preterm rupture of membranes. So as long as we are able to actually be able to confirm the gestational age is less than 34 weeks, there's room for tocolysis for us to be able to mature the fetal lungs um, within the 48 hour period. So the answer to each is that this, the answer is yes. Role of steroids after 34 weeks of gestation. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists actually just give um, guide that we give up until 34. But if you're reading the RCOG, we actually give corticosteroids even for those mothers going for elective C-sections after 38 weeks and six days. So it depends again which guideline you're looking at. To be on the safer side, many of us usually use the R code when it comes to these steroids of 38 plus six days. Um, any other question? The dexamethasone is it's an IM, it's an IM dose. Yeah, the others were answers for one of your questions. So All right, thank is... you very much. So let's go open mm -hmm. the floor to the rest of the senior colleagues, especially so on to my last slide. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, for that. And um... Uh, you brought in an interesting angle of um, dexamethasone and uh, reduced feet of movements and uh, hastening of delivery. And uh, I think that is um, as we advance in um, obstetric care, then the tests of uh, whether you deliver or not is um, mainly a CTG, a 20 minute CTG um, provides uh, that uh, provides more information, so to speak, on uh, your safety for 24 hours. So, and uh, that probably may not be affected so much by uh, the dexamethasone, but uh, if you combine it together with a resistive index, an umbilical resistive index and um, uh, cerebrolatory mm -hmm. resistive index, that helps you make a decision. But uh, that is very interesting that dexamethasone could lead to these features that uh, make you deliver faster. And it's uh, something new I've learned today. 
Uh, All right, uh, we learned every day. Thank you for that. But um, I'm really hoping moving forward, most of our centers in Central Region will be able to have a CTG. Let's see what individually we can be able to lobby for and improve on the outcomes of these moms. Okay, Dr. Kanye, thank you so much for the good presentation. Indeed, you've taught us a lot. Um, my comment will be on uh, dexamethasone, the 12 milligrams versus six milligrams. Um, you, yes, there's actually evidence for that. I wish I'll, I'll pull it and maybe send it on the group. I know most uh, bodies advocate for six milligrams twice a day for two days, but the 12 milligram uh, regimen is uh, tends to be more convenient because it's twice a day and you complete the dose in one day. What is contraindicated is giving the full dose, that is the 24 milligram uh, dose at a go, but we'll pull the evidence and send it. And then someone had asked about uh, giving dexamethasone from 34 weeks onwards, as uh, Dr. Kanye said, that is a, uh, quite a controversial area. And uh, there's actually an ongoing study or it has just ended. Maybe Dr. Kanye can comment on that. That was a multicenter study by WHO to uh, clarify that bit because uh, yes, there's evidence, there's reduced reduction in uh, respiratory uh, respiratory issues in the morbidity in the babies, but also a higher risk of neonatal hypo, hyperglycemia. So I think that's a still, still a gray area that is being studied, but in our setup, given that we have a lot of challenges, especially with respiratory uh, support of the neonates, I would still be an advocate of uh, giving dexamethasone after 34 weeks. <coughs> All right, um, so what was presented um, in April, I, I believe you're referring to the team that is being led by Professor Kureshid, the action trial. What they presented in April was the um, study that was trying to look at, should we give steroids or not through the action trial? But the one for um, decisional ages, still not as yet. And I think that's why we are still using the ACOG and the RCOG guidelines, where the ACOG says up until the 34, RCOG says up until 38 weeks and six days. So we wait for the team from Professor Kureshi to be able to present to us what they are studying, study findings, study findings. <laughs> the Kikuyu with me is coming out. Yes, what they were able to find. Dr. Moneki, anything to add? Let me unmute him. Dr. Hello, Kanye. Yes, yes. Hi. Give us some input. Um, you know, this topic is close to my heart. Huh? Kabisa. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know why you didn't pick it. Yes. Uh, the key thing that everyone initially uh, do not look at, we are busy doing the speculum, the nitrazine tests. One of the key things I like are reminding people is this is a woman who's losing a baby. And it's a very emotional time for her, for her. Regardless of whether the woman is losing a baby at 24 weeks or below 24 weeks or after 24 weeks, there is no time this is uh, comfortable enough for the lady. And so as much as you are doing the other physical aspect, it's always good to look into the psychosocial side and the counseling bit for this lady and taking them slowly, explaining to them and even when you don't know what the cause is, explain as much as you can. And um, avoid giving blanket, blanket reasons why that could have happened, uh, especially for things you are not sure that may traumatize the patient. Don't go telling the patient you are losing the baby because you worked too hard or because you used a boda boda or uh, tell them because your blood group and your husband's blood group is different. Because those are some of the things that patients come to tell us. Or because you ate pineapples, at least Dr. Kanye has elaborated what, what are the causes of this. So we be very gentle with the, with the patient. And as much as possible, we, always, we should always involve counseling in this. That's all for now. The COVID, that's a big debate. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where we are heading. 
Well, um, for us to find the answers, we, we are deep in the waters, but it's us to find the answers. All right, um, let me unmute Dr. Tungani. Dr. Tungani Mushiri, kindly give us a comment or two. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Grace. That was a good presentation. Now, I think you have touched on everything and my colleagues have also mentioned a lot. I want to say that when this mother delivers, we tend to forget her. She becomes an NBU mother. Let's also remember that she needs care. She needs her wound checked if she went for CS and all the care that uh, is due a postnatal woman. Thank you. All right, the floor is open. Anybody else um, with a comment? So um, if the pediatrician was, was here, um, what she would have added is after we give the babies to them, then, then what next? I know at my center, there's certain things that we are trying to lobby for, but there are certain things that we can still be able to do to be able to improve the outcome. Well, for the extremely preterm baby, that's going to be a catch. But for the very preterm and the late preterm, essential newborn care, um, keeping them warm, um, uh, always checking on their blood sugars, they don't tip into hypoglycemia, appropriate neonatal resuscitation, kangaroo mother care, the cord care, manage complications as they come up and where they really, really need that comprehensive NICU, then we are able to identify those babies as early as possible and the referrals are made as appropriate. So the floor is open to anyone else who has a comment. All right, over to you, Enoch. Thank you, Dr. Grace Kanye. We really appreciate that uh, very, very insightful uh, presentation. And thank you everyone for participating uh, and making this session lively. Um, without further ado, I would like to end this session in, uh, unless there's anyone with any question, uh, any concerns, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday um, again. So on Wednesday, we'll have um, research skills and development. Uh, and we'll be learning this uh, with Professor Anthony Wanyoro. So you're all welcome and see you then. All right, good night.